Coming up on We Talk News this week, we've got industry reaction to the DEA's recommendation moving cannabis to Schedule 3. Uh, it, it, it's everything for Nova Farms. It's everything for all the cannabis operators out there. And we'll talk with the Director of Government Relations for Normal, Morgan Fox. Prohibitionists are planning on uh, seeking judicial review after this point. This could potentially add another one to three years to the whole process. So we are looking at potentially six or seven years before this process uh, goes through all of its motions. Plus, a wild debate on C-SPAN between Deputy Director of Normal, Paul Armentano, and number one prohibitionist, Dr. Kevin Sabet. The question is legalization. The overwhelming majority of people did not support criminalization. They supported the what? That's irrelevant. Okay, gentlemen, you you should criminalization. Gentlemen, both of you can hold on to those thoughts. So, does getting high improve sex? Most men say yes, but women are a little more complicated. And there is something called female orgasm disorder, and Ohio wants to make that a medical card qualifier. Plus, New Hampshire takes a baby step towards adult use. We'll talk with state insider, former House Rep Tim Egan, and a flashback to the 51st New York City parade from last week. All that and coast-to-coast cannabis coverage on We Talk News with Elena Pinto, next. We are pro-cannabis media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Weed Talk News, Pro Cannabis Media's weekly program that covers the cannabis industry from coast to coast. I'm Elena Pinto. A week ago, the DEA agreed with the Health and Human Services recommendation to move cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act from 1971. Now that the dust has settled and people have been able to look at the implications of this move and how long the process will take, all eyes return to Congress. And that's where you find New York Senator Chuck Schumer touting his CAOA Act that covers the move to legalization and creates a regulatory board. PCM founder Jimmy Young talked with Morgan Fox of Normal about that this week. Morgan, thank you so much for joining us here on We Talk News this week. The biggest question on everybody's mind is everybody is getting excited about perhaps moving cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, according to the Controlled Substances Act. But now the industry is starting to look at Schedule 3 and saying maybe this is not the best thing for the industry. What's going on down there in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think that there's growing recognition of the inadequacies of Schedule 3 when it comes to real substantive cannabis policy reform. I mean, really, the only thing that it would do that would have a practical impact would be uh, potentially uh, removing the issue with 280E. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, that's not for certain, but the language is pretty clear that that would be uh, one of the other consequences of that. Um, But cannabis policy reform advocates are... uh, pretty strongly in alignment that descheduling is really the only way to bring state cannabis programs into alignment with federal law and to be able to do all the things that we need to do with cannabis at the federal level, including regulation and uh, uh, opening up pathways to research, but um, primarily removing criminal penalties and all of the other consequences that go along with cannabis use at the federal level. Um, Now, I think that it's, uh, it's questionable you know, if we're even going to see action on this uh, in the near term uh, or even before the election. When you look at just the facts, the DEA's announcement that they will agree with the Health and Human Services recommendation to move cannabis to Schedule 3 hasn't really changed anything. It is still federally illegal, but the bureaucratic process has begun and this move might still take years to be official. Now, there is some hope in the industry that prohibitionists in states and in Congress might soften their stance against this plant medicine. One of the most vocal and visible of those prohibitionists is Dr. Kevin Sabet from SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. He and one of Normal's deputy directors, Paul Armentano, appeared on a C-SPAN talk show for a debate about the implications of this proposed move to Schedule 3. 
In an unregulated market, you have products of a variety of potencies, and the user doesn't even necessarily know the potency of the product they're getting. In a regulated sure. market, products are tested for purity and potency. Basically. That potency is placed on the label. The consumer can make an educated choice. And if lawmakers believe or don't want certain high potency products in their legal market, they can set potency caps. I don't have to tell Kevin, but some legal states like Vermont and Montana have already done that. Yeah. And they have capped yeah, the potency of certain THC products, just like some states have done that with alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, but the reality is, first of all, on the legal market, this is really key. This is, this is a PSA right now. If you're going to a hot shop today, buyer beware. You have no idea what's in there. The labels are completely, oh, you re regularly misrepresented the THC content, the mold, the pesticides, the bacteria. Um, it, it is actually, states are not able to regulate this, and they're not. Um, they're doing a horrible job of regulating it. And so you actually don't even know what you're getting in the legal market. But, Paul, I will take you up on going to Colorado and other states that have massive, deep-pocketed, vested interests and doing a potency cap. I don't have my head in the sand here, Paul. We're not, you know, so the fact that it's legal in Colorado, I get it. In California, that's not going to change anytime soon. I get it. So I'd love to partner with you. Let's go there. With more on the process and its implications, here's Andrew Beringer in Washington, D.C. I'm Andrew Beringer, and this is the D.C. Area Report for We Talk News. Anne Milgram, the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, remained tight-lipped about the agency's recent proposal to reschedule cannabis during a congressional committee hearing this week. Milgram stated it would be inappropriate for her to comment further on the DEA's determination to reclassify cannabis as a Schedule Three controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act. The proposed rescheduling, which aligns with a recommendation from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, has sparked a widespread debate and speculation within the cannabis industry and policy circles. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering and asking, well, what does this really entail of rescheduling? Well, the DEA's proposal to reclassify cannabis from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act is considered the biggest thing to happen in the cannabis world at the policy level in 50 years. Rescheduling to Schedule 3 would mean the federal government recognizes cannabis has accepted medical use and lower potential for abuse. Rescheduling also alone does not decriminalize or legalize cannabis federally, nor remove all barriers to research. Interstate commerce would still be prohibited, but could be an entryway or starting point for the future. The timeline for when cannabis would officially move to a Schedule 3 is unclear due to the rulemaking process and potential litigation delays. Cannabis businesses would no longer be subject to tax penalty 280E after rescheduling, allowing deduction of normal business expenses. Federal guidance like a new coal memo would accompany rescheduling to address FDA oversight, banking, event investments, etc. Descheduling through congressional action is the ultimate goal to fully address limitations of rescheduling and to stabilize state markets. The cannabis industry is urged to engage in the rulemaking process and push for congressional reform, leveraging momentum from rescheduling into eventual descheduling. I'm Andrew Berenger, reporting for We Talk News. I'll see you next week. So what impact will the beginning of the process have on states that are considering adult use legalization? Well, that is still to be determined. But in New Hampshire this week, a bill to legalize cannabis for adult use passed through a judicial committee for the first time. According to the Marijuana Policy Project Director for New Hampshire, Karen O'Keefe, she said this week that this development alone gives hope that a legal bill could pass before the end of this year. If that happens, New Hampshire would be the 25th state to legalize cannabis for adults. Our man in New Hampshire is Tim Egan, a former congressman in the state who is now the chairman of the board for the New Hampshire Cannabis Association. 
Tim talked with PCM founder Jimmy Young this week about this development. Jimmy, New Hampshire is the closest it's ever been to legalizing cannabis and creating some type of recreational consumer opportunity. Is it a bill that I love? Hardly. It's state-run, 15 stores limited, controlled by the State Liquor Commission. It could be like the worst thing possible, but it's legalization. So those of us that have been pushing for legalization, myself for six years, four years in the House, two years been out of the House as the chair of New Hampshire can, it's like a light at the end of the tunnel. Is it headlights of a car that's going to miss us? Is it a freight train coming at us? Or is it bright sunlight? I'm not really sure yet. And if we can create a level of safety for consumers that want cannabis in New Hampshire, that's the smart thing to help people with, whether we make money with it or not. Right now, you want to buy cannabis in New Hampshire, you don't know if someone's growing it on their farm or it's being trucked in with some meth from someplace out of the state or or what. So, you know, the, this makes sense for the state of New Hampshire. It legalizes it. It makes it an economic development tool. And it answers the call of consumers in the state, residents in the state saying, it's high time we have access to this like every other state does. The state of Connecticut is still in its first year of operating a, a legal adult use market for cannabis. But a court decision delivered this week is going to shake up plenty of people in that state. And appellate court in Connecticut ruled that an employer has the right to fire any employee who reports to work under the influence even if they are medical patients. The appellate court also ruled employers can mandate drug testing at the workplace. One of the things that happens in many legal states is that emergency room visits go up because children are getting into their parents' stash of edibles and they look like candy. So it's a growing concern, but better packaging and education of parents to lock up their stash can make a dent in the increase in visits. And now the state will be keeping data on these incidents. Joe Parsons is our man in Virginia that is still reeling from the canceled art and cannabis show from 420. Here he is. I'm Joe Parsons with the Virginia Cannabis Connection, and this is your Virginia Cannabis Report on Weed Talk News. There was a large-scale raid conducted by the DEA late last week in Bedford County at an alleged legacy cannabis event by a cannabis club calling themselves the Bedford Secret Sesh. DEA agents, heavily armed in full riot gear, stormed the event and closed down not just the event, but the entire group itself. Bedford Secret Sesh members have made a public call to the Virginia Senate and claimed that this was only a private members-only event and that the raid was cruel and unnecessary. Details of arrest or what was confiscated have not been released officially as of this report. So what brought an end to this cannabis club, you may ask? Was it a detailed months-long investigation with several undercover agents involved? Or was it complaints from the small-town community that got the attention of the DEA? Nope, none of those were to blame. It was the fact that they advertised their events on Facebook. And when cover charges started to appear, on members-only events, it quickly gained the attention of the DEA. The Bedford Secret Sesh has started an online petition on change.org to the state Senate to allow the club to reopen and operate legally within the county. But as of this report, the club is now permanently closed. A pro-cannabis media exclusive. It's time to bring a conclusion to the Virginia 420 Festival event with an interview with the man who wanted to create the first dual location cannabis festival in Virginia, Winston Marsden. He wanted to tell his side of the story to pro cannabis media on why he canceled the festival so abruptly. Now, after meeting with him, I can truly say that his intentions and passion for the cannabis community were definitely there, but his financial backers and his other business partners involved were apparently not. My vision would have been is that I saw everyone come together. And that was awesome. I mean, I think that's the greatest thing that I did see that a dual location festival works. It's just that the partners that are in it have to work together cohesively to make sure that ball stays in place. I was left here. I bet I was here every day from that day paying back money. I didn't get an invitation to any parties. And I'll be honest with you, I would have loved to have been up there on that stage at Gary Farms and to been able to, but with the amount of backlash from threats to being called a con man to everything that just hit me 
you know, and, you know, there was no invitation, you know, there was just uh, me piecing this thing back together. And that's what I'm going to do. I want to thank Winston Marsden for talking with pro cannabis media. The full interview can be seen on my blog channel, the Virginia cannabis connection. Well, that's going to do it for this week's Virginia cannabis report from the Virginia cannabis connection and reporting for weed talk news. I'm Joe Parsons. Until next time, stay lifted. That'll do it for the A Block of Weed Talk news for this week. Stay with us as we start our state-to-state -state cannabis coverage from coast to coast and wait until you hear about what is going on in New York. Weed Talk news continues with the B Block after the break. And what we want to do is we want to help birth some new entrepreneurs because you need capital to be able to do that. You know, we feel like the social equity uh, licenses are a first start, but if you don't give that person cash or, or, or credit or money, it's like giving someone a Ferrari with no gas in it. You, you can't get any place. Hey guys, this is Cannabis with Kim B. I'm filling in for Jimmy Young. He went outside to the bathroom. He's a funny duck. But I just have to tell you, I'm the CMO of Tribe Tokes, and I also love pro-cannabis media. Before we get to the B Block, we have breaking news out of New York. I'm PCM founder Jimmy Young. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has seen enough from the current administration of the Office of Cannabis Management. The Green Market Report and the New York Times are reporting that the head of the commission, Chris Alexander, has been asked to resign. Now, besides that news, the commission still issued 104 licenses in all categories, dispensary, grow, manufacture, and distributor this week. And now, Mayor Eric Adams warned the illegal shops operating in his city that he has a lock with their name on it. The city did shut down 20 operations over the past week, but still has another, oh, 2,500 odd illegal storefronts to deal with. That's the breaking news in the B Block. Now we go back to Elena Pinto for more of We Talk News. Hi everyone, I'm Elena Pinto and welcome to the B Block of Weed Talk News. Remember, if you want to watch our entire news show, it is available on Mondays on the ProCannabisMedia.com website. Now let's turn to New York, a state that continues to deal with over 2,500 illegal stores in the city. This week, Mayor Eric Adams proclaimed that he is ready to shut down non-licensed stores and already shut down 20 of them this week. Now that law enforcement has been backed up by their governor and the mayor, police feel more comfortable putting on locks on the doors of those illegal shops. That crazy scene didn't stop, though, the New York Cannabis Parade on the last weekend of April. It was the 51st parade that used to be an act of civil disobedience and is now just a celebration of how far New York has come, even though the city is overrun with illegal storefronts. One of the organizers of that parade is Steve Bloom, the celeb stoner, and he puts it in perspective now that the state is officially legal. I'm Steve Bloom, publisher of Celeb Stoner and a former editor of High Times, reporting for Weed Talk News. I also wear another hat as director of the New York City Cannabis Parade and Rally, which took place last Saturday, May 4th in Manhattan. It was the 51st annual Cannabis Parade, which was founded by the Yippies in 1973 as a march and a smoke-in. Now, the marijuana, now that marijuana is legal in New York, the event has pivoted to more of a celebration than a protest. We won in 2021, ending prohibition in New York State, and we're still celebrating. What's also different about the event over the last two years is our partnership with the City of New York and Cannabis NYC. 
Whereas in the past, we were a thorn in the side of city officials, NYPD, we, are now, we now have their full backing and work together. Let's say it's been a long, strange trip to get to where we are today. Saturday began as a speak, as a speak out in Herald Square, where the parade contingents, floats, and other vehicles assemble. The March South zigzags its way to Union Square Park and arrives there at 1 p.m., where we have a stage and a marketplace of sponsors and vendors. A who's who of contemporary cannabis leaders made speeches, and there were performances by rapper Havoc from Mob Deep, Grammy-nominated guitarist Raul Madan, and others. Backstage, a former pro hoopster, Lamar Odom, and other celebs showed up. All of our sponsors were affiliated with the new legal market in New York, and many were, many were retail licensees, several of whom got to speak about their experiences in a city that's inundated with unregulated stores. The Prater Rally is an expression of the new legal market, and we support that 100%. The day ended with a fantastic after party at the TAC Museum in Soho. Overall, it was a success with good weather to boot. We couldn't have had asked for more. That will do it for the New York City uh, Cannabis Report. I'm Steve Bloom reporting for We Talk News. Minnesota was the 23rd state to legalize adult use of cannabis last year, and now the regulatory structure is being debated. One group that is determined to take advantage of the new legal climate in that state is 10 tribes of indigenous natives. They are not bound by federal laws, but they are cooperating with state officials on the licensing and rulemaking process. That state is even considering allowing the tribes to enter urban locations off their tribal land. No worries about that in California. It's still the nation's number one cannabis market, and it's where Lavana Vassal reports from every week. I'm Lavana Vassa from the Bay Sash, reporting for PCM with this week's California report for We Talk News. Union membership and participation is growing in California. Following a nasty union busting campaign from their employer, workers at Nabis Warehouse in California have vetoed, voted overwhelmingly to join Teamsters Local 630. The 84 new Teamsters work as drivers and warehouse associates. Teamsters recruits and United Food and Commercial Workers are the two most active in the industry. This came a few weeks after Ease, one of the biggest delivery services in the state, averted a strike called for on 420, ending nine months of negotiations. The much anticipated new social equity funds are finally getting distributed. Funds specifically designated to help social equity licensees to launch businesses have been given out to 13 districts in the state, including San Francisco, Oakland, and Coachella. Despite widespread corruption of these social equity programs, they are still important and necessary to give opportunity and access to en an entry into the very costly industry, especially for those affected most by the war on drugs. New Jersey Democrats... Democratic Senator Cory Booker visited the Natura facility in Sacramento, Northern California's manufacturing and distribution hub. There was a raid on a sm and there was a raid on a smoke shop in the Marin County city of San Rafael, which is slightly ironic because Marin County is home to what was the country's first medical dispensary back in the 90s, the Marin Alliance, founded by a woman named Lynette Shaw. However, medical patient caregiver, caregiver collectives like the Marin Alliance all over the state went out of business when Prop 64 Adult Use Act was introduced because they did not meet the new zoning and other regulation standards created by local jurisdictions. In the case of Marin County, despite the people of Marin voting to have dispensaries, the local government vetoed the people's choice and restricted the cannabis retail sales to delivery only. That's all I got time for today. I'm Lavana Vassa from the Bay Sesh reporting for PCM with this week's California report for We Talk News. The two most recognizable names in the cannabis industry are Cheech and Chong. The legendary comedic actors from California continue to be two of the most well-known faces and names in the recent legal movement. And now they return to Arizona with their products, thanks to a deal with Oz and Jars Cannabis. With more from Arizona, here's Karen Black. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting with the Arizona Cannabis Report for We Talk News. And I've got some exciting news. Cannabis and comedy icons Cheech and Chong are making a grand comeback to the Grand Canyon State. 
The legendary duo has teamed up with Oz Cannabis and Jars Cannabis to bring their iconic brand back to Arizona. Fans have been eagerly awaiting the return of Cheech and Chong's signature strains and edibles, which are now available statewide at Jars Dispensaries. Talk about a blast from the past. In business news, Phoenix-based Tilt Holdings has secured a $10.5 million promissory note from an undisclosed experienced retailer and operator for its Pennsylvania Standard Farm subsidiary. Tilt plans to use the funds to establish and build out three retail locations in the Commonwealth. As we previously reported, the Wesson Freedom Team initiated a petition in late 2023 named the Wesson Gun Equality Act. They claim it's a violation of both the Second and Fourteenth Amendments to deny medical cardholders gun ownership. The petition needs nearly 256,000 signatures by July 3rd, less than two months from now, to qualify for November's ballot. I spoke with the originator of the petition, John Taylor, to get an update. He hasn't gotten the traction he'd hoped, perhaps because the petition can only physically be signed in Kingman, Arizona, and he's now considering avenues to make it a legislative rather than a ballot measure this fall. Mr. Taylor also started a second petition, the Wesson Medicinal Act, which would eliminate criminal charges for medicinal mushroom cardholders and decrease the penalty for use by non-call cardholders to misdemeanors. We'll continue following both. And finally, the health department has recalled a batch of the flower shop's onion bahi flower for testing positive for aspergillus. All product has been pulled from store shelves and no illnesses have been reported. That's all for this week's Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting reporting for We Talk News. Another positive sign on the DEA's decision to start to move cannabis onto Schedule 3 is that the publicly traded stocks have exploded. When it comes to the stock market, we turn to Doug Miller, who is high on Wall Street. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's Cannabis Stock Report for Weed Talk News. Green Thumb Industries, a leading national cannabis consumer packaged goods company and owner of Rise Dispensaries, reported its financial results ending March 31st, 2024. Let's go over some of these numbers. First quarter revenue of $276 million increased 11% over the prior year period. Cash at quarter end of $244 million Cash flow from operations of $84 million increased 12% compared to quarter one of 2023. They purchased 1,067,000 subordinate voting shares for a total of $13.6 million. And let's look at the balance sheet because that's what's really important. They have $419.7 million, including cash and cash equivalents of $223.9 million. Total debt outstanding was $309.9 million, consisting of long-term mortgages and $223.7 million in senior debt. The company is current on income taxes payable. This is one of the very few cannabis companies that's profitable, and they are for a reason. They're making smart decisions, and they're focused on quality and not expanding too fast. So let's look at the stock chart. It's trading around $12.85, and it's curling up on this news. Watch for dips and trade smart. And that's this week's Cannabis Stock Report. Reporting for Weed Talk News, I'm Doug Miller. Last week, the cannabis legalization news spent a lot of time on the DEA announcement. They were agreeing with the HHS recommendation of moving cannabis to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act. Let's see what the boys from Illinois are talking about this week. Here's an excerpt from their Sunday live show. Last week, the cannabis legalization news spent a lot of time on the DEA announcement. They were agreeing with the HHS recommendation of moving cannabis to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act. Let's see what the boys from Illinois are talking about this week. Here's an excerpt from their Sunday live show. But uh, have you seen the news out of Minnesota? Yes. This one was very odd. 
And so in Minnesota, they have a certain bill of rights. Let me just look for F-A-R um, farms. Now, let's see, the word, the word farm appears quite often in, it kind of makes sense. There it is. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw this up real quick. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it is not very large. And so that, that helps. And then so does this, 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 and oh, unfortunately we're in section 15. We have to go to, let's go to four and then five. There it is, section seven of article one of the miscellaneous subjects. And of course this is, if you were keeping track at home, the constitution of the state of Minnesota, article 13, miscellaneous subjects. Section seven, no license required to peddle, which is a fancy verb to mean sell. As they kind of equate it right here, any person may sell or peddle the products of the farm or garden occupied and cultivated by him without obtaining a license, therefore. Which means that if you have a tomato garden, you may sell or peddle those tomatoes, I'm assuming. And a lawsuit, this is coming out of Marijuana Moment, is saying that the Minnesota Constitution gives everybody in Minnesota the right to, if you have the license to, I guess, grow weed and sell it without a license. But then they say, you don't need a license. And why don't you need a license? Because a person may sell or peddle the products of the farm or garden occupied and cultivated by him without obtaining a license, therefore. So some licenses, we don't need no stinking licenses in Minnesota. Meanwhile, I'm trying to sell licenses in Minnesota. Well, I'm trying to sell services to obtain a license yeah. to clients who qualify for one in Minnesota. That will wrap it up for the B block of We Talk News. We have one more section to go. It's called the C block for now. And we'll have more stories from states from all over the U.S. and Canada. So don't go away. It's a whole new world of weed out there, isn't it? Everyone is learning new ways to titrate, ingest, consume, imbibe, and engage with this plant medicine we call cannabis. Now let me tell you my cannabis story. You know, I've had four major surgeries in the past 23 years and suffer from osteoarthritis with a variety of metal parts in my body and one on deck. Now, thanks to those chronic pain issues, I've been a medical patient in Massachusetts for almost 10 years now. I remember my first trip to a dispensary just outside of Boston, and I told the bud tender I didn't want to smoke it anymore. So I tried edibles, then tinctures, then vaping. And now if I'm going to smoke, I only use the Weejits filtration system. What? The Weejits.com, Weejits, that's weed, W-E-E-D, G-E-T-S.com, is where you'll find the planet's coolest product that cools the smoke from everyone's favorite flower. The guy that started this was a pretty good medical device manufacturer, and he created this maze pipe that cools the smoking process from 1300 degrees Fahrenheit upon inflammation down to just 90 degrees when it reaches your mouth. That's right, 1300 down to 90. That's why this maze pipe is amazing. Now, Add in the code of PCM TV and you get 15% off. So just go to Weejits.com and check out the best way to enjoy a cooler smoke with less coughing and hacking and more peace of mind. Welcome back to the C Block of We Talk News. I'm Elena Pinto. If you are a regular viewer of our news show, you know that the state of Missouri has set all sorts of records for sales. Many of their policies and regulations are unique to that state, including public consumption that can vary from town to town. When it comes to the Show Me State, we have Brandon Jones with our Missouri Report. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones with B Green Distribution with Missouri Candor Support, the We Talk News. And yes, we've already seen some of the rescheduling uh, news come out and change some things here in Missouri. I've already seen layoffs are, have already started to happening. And we've just seen the anticipation of the change that might come with this rescheduling process because 
you don't know here it's a finite market there's so there's only a certain number of licenses that were released those license holders are now a little bit worried that that means that opens the door to other people to be able to produce cannabis here in the state of Missouri and sell it legally so they're starting to lay off and do some little thinking about what's going to have to happen with their processes here in the state of Missouri others are cutting back on just their expenditure uh, I see some accounts not spend as much on swag and other items just because they're trying to make sure that they don't get overextended in this period that they have kind of flux and not know what's going on. Another big news that happened here in Missouri, the cannabis science community came in and just took over downtown Kansas City. The Marriott in downtown was taken over by scientists and all sorts of different uh, people in the technology industry that half of them didn't know what they were talking about as far as cannabis consumption. But they've got some really cool ideas as far as technology. And I don't think I've been in a room with that many bi microbiologists since college. <laughs> if you don't know, I have a my math and physics background. So I used to hang out with the nerds all the time. And it was kind of cool to be back in that environment and see all those people that are now trying to find their way into cannabis and seeing the cool technologies they come out with. Obviously, it's Mother's Day weekend. What a big shout out to all the mothers out there and everybody that's doing all those to help raise their children and to just, you know, do everything that, that they can to. Be, be be there for their families. My mother is my angel on earth. So if you don't know my story, I was a really bad car wreck, went through a really bad opioid addiction. And if any of those that have been addicted to anything knows that you become a user of not just that particular item, but you become a user of everyone in your life. And I took way too much advantage and put my mother and the rest of my family through hell for a very long period of time until finally, you know, I got off that opioids and found a new true plant medicine that helps me. So thank you so much, mom. I love you. Thank you for always being there for me, even through those horrible times when I was not a good human. And thank you so much for being the best grandmother that you are too. So again, I'm Brandon Jones with Bee Green Distribution. This is the Missouri Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. They edu educated and medicated. And happy Mother's Day, all mothers. See you next week. Now let's head out west to get caught up with two of the oldest regulated states, Oregon and Washington State. Here's Matthew Friedlander in Washington and Marianne Kersaji in Oregon. I'm Marianne from Alibi with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. News out of Oregon this week includes a landmark legal ruling. Attorney Kevin Jacoby won a case challenging the immunity of Oregon's Cannabis Regulatory Agency employees. There have been stories over the years of OLCC inspectors harming people, property, and reputation. Until this ruling, those government employees were granted immunity from any consequences of their actions. This left licensees in a difficult position. We'll see if this ruling is challenged or not, but this is great news, putting some guardrails on the powers of agency inspectors. Per Jacoby Law, this ruling underscores the maxim that nobody is above the law. And next, publicly traded company Kaya Holdings announced this week that in addition to its cannabis licenses in Oregon, it has received a license to administer psilocybin products in Oregon. The psilocybin market has been hampered by high costs due to stringent regulations. So hopefully they can find a way to provide psilocybin services at affordable rates. And finally, intoxicating hemp products continue to make news. While not allowed for sale in Oregon, they can be manufactured and shipped to other states. This is a hot topic with many strong opinions. The regulations surrounding this may change with this year's Farm Bill. A number of Oregon operators, including Utopia, have launched hemp products to expand their product offerings. That's the Oregon Cannabis Report for this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi for Weed Talk News. Hi, I'm Matthew Friedlander, coming to you from The Collective in Seattle uh, with this week's Washington State Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Uh, pardon the, the noise in the background, but we just finished up with our ninth annual Cannabis Summit uh, here for the Cannabis Alliance. Uh, we had a great conversation about all things cannabis, uh, equity in the cannabis space, descheduling, rescheduling, uh, the intersection of hemp and cannabis, uh, a whole lot of things. It was a, it was a great day. Uh, there will be lots of information up on the Cannabis Alliance website, so you can check out that at thecannabisalliance.us. Um, 
that's what I've got for you this week. Uh, I think my brain's a little bit fried. Uh, we have been talking since 9 o'clock this morning. It's about 6.30. Um, so I'm going to sign off for today, but that's what I've got for you this week uh, for the Washington State Cannabis Court for We Talk News. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Cannabis advocates in Texas are disappointed that the city of Lubbock rejected a measure that would have decriminalized small amounts of cannabis in that city. It wasn't even close, with 65% of voting residents rejecting the ordinance. Now that state's attorney general, Ken Paxton, is starting legal action against five towns in Texas that have already voted to decriminalize small amounts of cannabis, including the capital, Austin. With more from the Lone Star State, here's Lisa Williams. I'm Lisa Williams, founder of the Toke Agency, with the Texas Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Hold on to your hats, we got the Texas Cannabis Roundup coming at ya. Last weekend, voters in Lubbock overwhelmingly rejected, by a margin of 30 percentage points, 65% opposed the measure, 35% supported it, to decriminalize possession of less than four ounces of marijuana. The proposed reform drew loud opposition from local conservatives. Texas has helped fuel New Mexico's cannabis industry. While the Texas legislature continues to reject legalized cannabis and the millions of tax revenue it could provide, West Texans continue to flock to their neighbors in New Mexico. Since New Mexico went wreck in April of 2022, the dispensaries just across the Texas border have seen a record $71 million in sales. Local dispensaries in Sunland Park, New Mexico estimate a whopping 80% of their current customers hail from Texas. A few Texans have been reported to say, hey, Texas legislature, get with the times. In other Texas cannabis news, Austin-based Goodblend, one of three approved suppliers under the Texas Limited Medical Marijuana Program, on Tuesday opened its first permanent location in San Antonio, Texas. Goodblend has current locations in Austin and Plano and looking to expand to Houston soon. Under the current regulations, supplies cannot be stored at retail sites, so they must be shipped back to the Austin headquarters nightly. I'm Lisa Williams, founder of the Toke Agency, with the Texas Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. The state of Vermont might be revoking a grow license from a company that has been cited for fungicide. It's in their flower. Holly Cannabis had their products seized from dispensaries and shut down their grow until the State Cannabis Commission can inspect. This is the second time Holland Cannabis has been infected. We know there is always something going on in the 702 area code. That's the area code for Las Vegas. Here's Tina Tasaka with the Nevada Report. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies, and this is the Nevada Report for Weed Talk News. Beginning on June 5th, 2023, and concluding on October 2nd, 2023, the CCB, Cannabis Compliance Board, conducted a routine audit and investigation of a cultivation. There were a total of seven violations, and each were levied with a fine from the CCB. These infractions included the following. Number one, the cultivation did not have a business license for the city of Las Vegas. Although located in Clark County, the cultivation allegedly sold products to dispensaries in Las Vegas. The CCB suggested a $20,000 fine for this plus another $10,000 whammy for an unintentional false statement. Number two, certain security cameras were not functioning properly and the security malfunction log was not filled out. The fine, 20,000. Number three, there were errors allegedly between metric and entries on the clone logs. The harvest logs did not have the final yield weight of usable cannabis in grams. The CC fine, 7,500. Other infractions included expired agent card, waste logs not reported properly, visitor logs not properly filled out, and inventory reports not filled properly. 
In totality, the fines suggested by the CCB are 80,000. The Cannabis Compliance Board, State of Nevada, has filed against 1212 LLC for these violations April 22nd, 2024. Hey, UNLV students, alumni, and fans, great news out of UNLV. This spring, UNLV announced the five reasons to be proud rebels, and number three was the establishment of the Cannabis Policy Institute. Southern Nevada is an emerging center for cannabis industry with roughly $1 billion in annual legal cannabis sales and new consumption lounges opening and more to follow this year and beyond. This institute is in position to lead cannabis policy discussions relative to the state and country. Leading the institute is alumna Rihanna Durrett. Well, I say go Rebels. That's it for the 702. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies and Weed Talk News. The last time we checked in on Ohio, it seemed like that state was making progress on launching their adult use program. So let's see if anything has been delayed. Here's Harry Bernstein. This is Harry Bernstein with Verde Compliance Partners and the Ohio Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. In our last report, we discussed how Ohio's adult use cannabis program is on the fast track to becoming a reality with the state required to award dispensary licenses by September 2024. This week, we have exciting updates to share along with some potential challenges. Ohio is still on base to begin, excuse me, pace to begin taking applications for adult use dispensaries in June and has created a fast track process to grant medical cannabis licensees an adult use permit. This could lead to a faster than anticipated opening of the adult use market, with some speculating that stores could be open as soon as this July 4th. However, the president of the Ohio Senate has indicated that they would consider amending the law, changing tax rates, and reducing or eliminating home grow. These potential changes could impact the implementation timeline and the accessibility of cannabis for Ohio residents. Additionally, there are still plenty of questions to be answered before the market can open such as THC limits and packaging rules. One option being discussed is to allow adult use licensees to sell medical cannabis products for adult use. While this could speed up the process, it also raises concerns about potential supply shortages for medical patients. Despite these challenges and potential legislative changes, Ohio is making significant progress toward implementing its voter approved adult use cannabis program. With the potential for current medical cannabis licensees to obtain adult use licenses and start serving customers soon, Ohio's position in itself as a national leader in the cannabis industry. As the state continues to work out the details of the adult use market and navigate potential amendments to the law, we can expect to see new jobs, tax revenue, and economic growth in Ohio. Stay tuned for more updates on this exciting, this exciting and evolving development. This is Harry Bernstein with Verde Compliance Partners for the Ohio Report for Weed Talk News. And finally tonight, sex and weed. I got your attention, didn't I? So, is sex better when you are high? Well, there is a new study that concludes that not only is sex more intense when you are under the influence, it can actually enhance or help women to orgasm. It's in the news this week because Ohio is considering adding female orgasm disorder to its list of qualifying medical conditions for its medical program. The 10-page study in the Journal of Sexual Medicine concludes that among those who suffer from FOD, 71% of women reported it helped them climax. Another 67% said it improved satisfaction from achieving an orgasm. So keep that in mind and talk with your partner before anxiety takes over a healthy part of adult life. And that will do it for this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Elena Pinto. Remember, it is a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. We are pro-cannabis media.